let's jump right into it. So we've got four hours in this tutorial, and I intend to let you all take lots of breaks because I'm aware that this is going to be an intense experience. The tutorial is sort of broken up into four parts. The first is just what is property-based testing anyway? Well, maybe you got some idea from the blurb, but hopefully I can give you more of an idea here. Then we're going to talk about describing your data, that is how you work out what inputs your test should accept and how to describe those. Then common test tactics or design patterns. Uh, and then finally, some of the practical stuff that other tutorials or documentation sometimes sort of skip over. Like, how do you configure this? What's the difference between a regular CI job and what you would do maybe if you wanted a nightly run, that kind of thing. Uh, so we'll talk about the settings and the performance issues that you get. So property-based testing 101. Uh, to start with, uh, let's talk about what testing is in the first place. For the sake of this talk, I'm talk describing testing as the art of science of running your code and then checking that it did the right thing. So there's a bunch of other cool things you can do to make sure that your code has less bugs that are not testing. Putting assertions in your code is a great habit, but it's not by this definition testing. It's a great complement to testing. It makes your test more effective, but it's not itself testing. Using a type checker like MyPy or PyWrite, depending on your project, can be a useful way to avoid some bugs, but it's not testing. Using a linter like Flake 8 or uh, PyLint, getting your colleagues to review your code, making sure that you've got enough sleep the night before or coffee the morning of, as you prefer. All of these are great techniques for having less buggy code, but they're not what I'm going to be talking about today. What I am talking about, though, in testing, there's a whole bunch of sort of different subcategories or subdivisions of tests. And just like a few kinds of those, there are what people call unit tests. We have a relatively small thing that just checks what some small piece of code does with the program. You might have an integration test, which is a unit test with a bigger unit. People keep arguing about the definitions here, but that's the only one I've found. There are snapshot tests where you run your code and save the output, like take a snapshot of it, and so that in future you can rerun the code and check that you got the same output later. That can be quite useful for a lot of things. There's parameterized tests where you give it a list of inputs and outputs, like a table, and make sure that every entry of the table is held. There are fuzz tests where you just put in random stuff and see if your code crashes. Those turn out to be embarrassingly effective. Uh, and then what we'll be talking about today are property tests or property-based tests, which are essentially the same as fuzz tests, but you can add assertions about what your code did as well. They can check, for example, that if you save your data and then you load it back, you get the same data that you just saved. That one's pretty easy to screw up and also quite important not to screw up. And then lastly, there are what we call stateful or model-based tests. Um, those are a pretty cool generalization of property tests, but because this is an introduction, I'm basically just going to tell you what they do. And if you ever need them, you can go consult the documentation. Uh, so with apologies to my friend David, uh, he mentions that every time someone uses reversing a list twice to gem demonstrate property-based testing, he drinks. It's not a drinking game, he just doesn't like bad examples. The example there is that if you reverse a list twice, you should get the same list. But this is like almost impossible to stuff up, and it's not really a problem that anyone ever tries to solve in the first place. So it's not a great example. Um, on that basis, let's talk about sorting lists. Sorting is a little bit more complicated than reversing. And what I've put up here are three tests that you might write for a sorting function. We're just imagining here that you don't trust the sorted built in. But Python's built-in functions are, in fact, pretty well tested. So we might test that if we sort the list 1, 2, 3, we get the list 1, 2, 3. And if we try this with floats, 3, 2, 1, we get 1, 2, 3. And we can also do this with strings. If we try to sort B, C, A, we get A, B, C. What do people think about these tests? Yeah, they're okay, but they're pretty short. So it seems to do about the right thing, but it's not super You could, you absolutely could. And if you were going to do it forever, you might want to use a parameterized test where you can just write the list of all the inputs and outputs. And that makes it much easier to add more examples. If you know, one of your clients or another person on your team reports a bug, you can just add it to the list and send it in to write a whole new test. So that's a pretty good start. Um, but it'd be even better if you didn't have to think up the correct output by hand as well. You could just say, this input is something we want to test. And so sometimes you have a trusted reference input. This is actually maybe more common in science than in other domains, where often we'll be like re-implementing some older simulation or we're doing performance optimizations 
or we can run in single-threaded or multi-threaded mode. So often you can, in fact, just compare it to something else which you think is more likely to be correct or even just have not fully correlated bugs. But when you don't even have that, all is not lost. If we're testing a sorting function, we don't need to know how to correctly sort a list to check whether or not the output list is sorted. And so here we're saying, like, well, if we take all of our inputs and we sort them, and then we look at each pair of elements in the output, they should be in order. What do people think of this test? Sorry? It is more compact? Yep. Great question. Would this break on a single item? It would actually not break on a single item, but the loop would execute zero times because that second slice would give you an empty sequence, and then when you zip that together, you've got no items. So as long as the call to sort it can raise an exception, this test would pass on any single element list. Which seems fair, right? A single element list is always sorted. It does not assert the length. If you define sorted as return empty list, this test would pass. That seems like a bit of a problem, actually. So maybe we should check the length of the list. And we could also check that we have the same set of elements that we started with. Otherwise, you could just return range length what do people think about this test? It catches that link. It doesn't catch duplications. If, for example, you passed in one, two, one, and the sorting function returned one, one, two, this test would pass. You might wonder, like, is this a realistic bug? But if you want to be rigorous about testing, that's just the kind of edge case you want. So the mathematical definition of sorting is that it's a permutation of the input such that the output is in pairwise order. So here's that definition. Any issues with this test? No, this one should work for anything where you can compare the elements. M the main problem, I think, is just that calculating every permutation is pretty slow. Um, so we might want to check that we can use the collections of counter class. And so we say we have, have the same number of each distinct element in the input as the output. Um, congratulations, we've just invented property-based testing. So the sorting function has these two properties, right, that the outputs are in order, and that there are the same elements in the input as the output. And if you check those properties, that's what we call a full specification. That this test passes for every function, which is a correct sorting function, and fails on some input for every incorrect sorting function. Yep. Yeah, yeah, you could sort of assert this in either one. Yeah, that is in fact a full third of this talk, of this workshop. So part three, we're just going to be talking about design patterns of different properties that commonly come up. Um, but the other thing I want to emphasize is that what we call partial specifications are still really useful. Right? You don't have to be able to pin down the exact behavior to find a lot of bugs. So having invented property-based testing, the, the real question here is where do we come up with these weird edge case inputs? Uh, and my favorite answer is use hypothesis. So if we have the same body of our test function here, I've just elided all the comments in the same space, uh, we can say with hypothesis the given decorator, and we say that our argument is one of a list of some mixture of integers and floats, or a list of strings. You can't sort a list which is mixed numbers and strings because you can't compare numbers to strings. But you can compare integers to floats, so we're willing to have a list with those mixed in the same numbers. Does this seem fairly reasonable to people? Turns out this test fails now because of not a number. So if you compare not a number to anything, no matter whether you compare it's less than or greater than or equal to, it always returns false. 
So specifying what a sorting function should do with or not a number in the mix is a lot more complicated. And so often, I just say, like, I don't want this test to generate not a number. Find out things over the place. Or, well, infinity is fine, you just sort them through the range. They've got to be comparable. Um, and so that's property based testing in a very small nutshell. Um, the main advantage is here is that Hypothesis helps me by generating data that I wouldn't have thought of myself. Uh, and that's part of the reason for having this project, right? You can centralize all the effort of devious people coming up with horrible counterexamples into one place that then generates them for everyone. Uh, instead of checking that we get the correct result, we check that the result we got is not in so This is a slightly weaker test. You might want some traditional unit tests in this as well, or you can add those to a hypothesis test as I'll show you later. Um, but the last thing is that I often find that writing property-based tests helps me find bugs in my understanding of the problem, not just the code that I find. Where before I actually put this talk together, I had never really sat down and thought, what should my sorting function do if it has a not a number in here? It's not obvious. Um, and then finally, uh, a point that I didn't show here, but you often don't even need assertions in the body of your test. Often, just putting really weird inputs into your functions will cause Python to raise an exception somewhere, and that's often worth finding out on its own. This is especially powerful if you put those assertions in the code that you're testing, so that the, the error is raised as close as possible to the point where something that you didn't expect happened. All right, so we're going to take a brief interlude here to make sure that everyone can open up our exercises for this tutorial. So. I okay, just see a quick show of hands. Who has already had a link to this center? All right, most people, but not quite everyone. So I'm going to give us a moment just to make sure that we can set up. Uh, if you're having any trouble, raise a hand, and one of us will come around. All right. Yep. Uh, Great question. I think it basically depends on the kind of thing you're doing. Uh, so at work, we've often had to sort of use the conditional because we often run in op optimized mode, but we don't want the assertion to be optimized out. Uh, for things which are expensive that you don't want to check every time, sort of just in testing, not in production, the assert statement's great. I, I think this is basically an it depends kind of answer, which is why it's engineering. Yeah, yeah, that, that really depends. So for hypothesis itself, the way I tend to do this is that, well, well, my philosophy about the assert statement is that the assert statement should only be used for things which will always be true unless there is a bug in your code, right? So if it's something where the user might pass you a weird input, that should definitely be a conditional because that's a, a situation which you might actually need to handle as a library. If it's something like, um, Oh, there was a bizarre bug a while ago on PyPy where something wrapped improperly on 32-bit windows. And that we eventually caught by our assertion because we thought this was impossible, but we were just going crazy. We started asserting sort of every invariant we could think of and eventually one of them fired and testing. Yep. Yeah, I, I would think of it as being pretty much like a unit test in the same way that a parameterized test is kind of like a unit test. Yeah, like in terms of logic, you're writing a test like paired with the domain of possible inputs. So you're saying for all whatever, or like given any whatever, this should be true. Yep. Excellent. Can I see a show of hands? A hand up for everyone who does have it working. Have you got the tutorial? installed and working, or open in a binder? Not yet? Okay. Two minutes? Uh, if you have downloaded and installed things, or if you've clicked on the My Binder link and had a notebook open, then we're good. <laughs> 
let's jump into part two of the tutorial. So at the end of this one, we'll have our first sort of substantial block of exercises. And at the end of that time, our first break that you can get up, stretch your legs and so on. So describing your data. This is the bit where you work out how to get all the things that you might want as inputs to a test. Right, so I showed you before lists, numbers and strings, but there is in fact more to Python than lists and numbers and strings. Who here has ever used a Python data type that is not a list, an integer, a float or a string? Most of us, great, great. That's a relief. Um, so I tend to think about hypotheses, we call them strategies because the word generator was already taken in Python. So I think of hypothesis strategies as coming in a couple of different categories. The first is for scalar values, things like none, booleans, data times, date times, numbers, text, that sort of stuff. There's also collections of those, you know, lists, tuples, dictionaries, etc. And then we get into the kind of more specialized stuff. So the first is that you can modify all your strategies by mapping and filtering with whatever callable you like. There are certain special strategies like just and sampled from. A few ways to do recursive data because that does come up in practice. And then we'll talk about how to infer strategies so that you don't have to write them out by hand all the time because that can get a little tedious. So scalar values, as I mentioned, uh, the short version here is if it is a built-in type in Python or a common standard library type, there is probably a default strategy for it. So it includes dates, times, numbers, strings, and all the built-in specials. That's pretty simple. The numbers all tend to have a minimum and a maximum value. And for things like floats, you can also say whether or not you want to allow infinity, not a number, whether you want 64 or 32 or 16 bit floats, and whether subnormal numbers should be allowed. If you have never heard of subnormal numbers, congratulations. I'm just gonna walk through a couple of examples here. Uh, so this test uh, looks at a package called binary or not, which has a helper function is binary string. And so my colleague David wrote this very simple test. He said, well, given any thing from the binary strategy, which is a byte string, just call is binary string on it, and we won't check the output, we'll just see if it crashes. This works really well. Like, just test it, no need for an assertion, just call the thing. Uh, it crashed. It turns out the is binary or not function uh, used the chardet library internally, which tries to detect what character encoding this is for a Unicode string. And when chardet returns 100% confidence that it's a particular encoding, that is not intended to convey that it actually is a valid string for that encoding. But the binary or not package at the time thought that it did, just a simple miscommunication based on the docs. Uh, and so this bug was actually in some sense a bug in the understanding of the authors. Let's look at another one. Uh, there's the Mercurial tool, which is an alternative to Git. And it has this function to encode a byte string in UTF-8. And so we wrote a simple test that, well, if you take a binary string, and you convert it to UTF-8 and then back to a binary string, you should get the string you started with. Does this seem reasonable? You might be able to guess where this is going. Uh, we found another bug. Uh, and this one, I think, was something about UCS 16 surrogate characters, but the point is there were valid inputs to the function that caused it to crash. So this isn't even exam an example where it returned an output that didn't round trip. Everything where it returned did, in fact, round trip correctly. It was just that some possible inputs made it crash instead. So, of course, the point of finding these bugs is to fix them, and it was fixed very promptly. What about date times? So if we start with the date time and we get the ISO format string and then we parse it using date util and then ISO format that, it turns out that we could get a bug here as well where if the year had a single non-zero digit, like it was a year between zero and the year nine AD, and the year was equal to the seconds digit, then it would swap the month and the day, the year and the month, sorry. Um, who do you think they ever would have written a unit test that called this? No, me either. There is kind of an open question as to how much this kind of bug matters. I don't know. Like how many people are dealing with 
particular date times before the year 10. Um, it doesn't come up for me very often, I would think. Um, but I think it's a good example of kind of power of hypothesis about making general statements. All right, so much for individual scalar values. There are also collections. Uh, the simple one is lists. You can say what you want it to be lists of. You can put a minimum and maximum length on the list. And you can also say that it should be unique or unique by some particular function. For example, you might want a list of numbers which is unique by absolute value, or a list of strings which is unique by the lowercase version, for example. Um, you can also use things built on top of this, like the dictionaries or sets or iterable strategies. The tuples strategy is a little different to lists. Tuples is always for a fixed number of elements, where you specify a strategy for each index separately. So if you want a tuple consisting of, for example, an integer and a float and a string, you can do that. Or if you wanted a 3D point, you could describe that as a tuple of three floats. Um, there's also fixed dictionaries. If you want a specific set of keys uh, with a corresponding different kind of value for each, fixed dictionaries is how you specify that. This is feeling a little data dumpy. Yeah? Yeah, so if you want particularly like a, a JSON object with a name, key, and then some string, that would be fixed dictionaries, and you would pass name equals text. Uh, and then it would generate your dictionary where it had a key that was name, and the corresponding value was any possible Unicode string. So compared to the Faker library, Hypothesis is much more specialized to finding like weird data that breaks things. So Faker tends to emphasize in related libraries sort of realistic data, but we tend to argue that realistic data like you would see in production is good for performance testing, but because it's the same kind of data you see in production, it's less likely to trigger the real bugs for you. Uh, so let's look, yep. Uh, uh, it's, it's not a secret example. Exactly, but it is the kind of thing that we've written papers about. Uh, so the very short version is that we use a random number generator to choose between alternatives. Um, the rest of the secret is that we tend to think about this as taking some random string of bits and then parsing them into whatever values you ask for. So from that perspective, every strategy is secretly just a parser. Yeah, we, we will get into that in our settings. Uh, but yeah, that's that's related to how we make sure that we can find minimal examples and we always replay previous failures. So this should never be flaky. Um, let's look at a somewhat more site high flavored example. Let's suppose we're doing some advanced statistics and we want to calculate the mean of a list of numbers. So uh, the mean should always be at least the minimum and at most the maximum element, right? Seems reasonable. Uh, and the standard library has a statistics.mean function, which should implement the mean. So let's see what it does. If you give it two very large inputs, they overflow to infinity when you add them together. It's kind of classic problem. Uh, so much for lists. But do, do people kind of understand how we get here? Uh, I mean, it craps out when you run out of RAM. <laughs> but you can get a very large integer before you run out of RAM. Uh, hypothesis tends to restrain itself to 256-bit or so. Uh, we find if you need larger integers than that, like for a cryptography thing, you'll tend to be generating them as byte strings instead. Uh, but the other notable thing here is that the minimal example that it's found and reported to us is not actually any list that this happens to. It's the shortest possible list that you can get this kind of open right? Because you need at least two elements in this app. So we've got a list with exactly two elements, and these are in fact the smallest floats such that adding them together exceed infinity. So it's kind of nice that we get minimal examples, not just the random examples. Um, supposing though that you want something a little different, 
uh, the map and the filter methods are available on every strategy and quite useful. Map, you generate an example and then you apply the function that you're mapping over. But people like used map with pandas, for example, or the map built in, most people, is pretty similar here. If you want, for example, integers.map string, this will give you a piece of text, like a string object, which consists of digits, maybe with a minus sign at the front. If you didn't want the minus sign, you can pass min value equals zero to your integer strategy. Filter, on the other hand, is great if there are just like a small fraction of the inputs that we've generated that you don't want. You pass in a filter function, and if it returns false, hypothesis will just try again. And it will generate you a new example that eventually passes that filter function. Um, that kind of describes, in a nutshell, why it's not always the best idea as well. If you want, for example, integers.filter is prime, hypothesis is really going to struggle to find you primes by rejection sampling. So we might find like two, three, five, and then just give up. It take like 10 minutes trying to generate more things for you. Um, and so here's two different ways to generate an ordered pair of integers using these methods. The first is that we could filter, right? We say, well, we have this pair of integers and we want to throw away all the ones where they're not in order. The more efficient technique is to sort them and then turn them back into a tuple, right? So that way, all of the examples generated by this strategy on the inside will make it all the way through to the outside. Making sense so far? Cool. Some of the special strategies. The just strategy is where you have a value, but the API requires you to pass a strategy instead. One classic example is that the date time strategy requires time zones to be provided by a strategy. So if you want all of your date times to be from the same time zone, you can use the just strategy to give you just that time zone. Pretty simple. Sampled from. Uh, is pretty much what it sounds like. It's an element sampled from some sequence. So maybe you want an inner join or an outer join. Uh, this also works well with nums, if you're using nums, uh, including flag nums. It all just magically does exactly what you want. Another two special strategies are one of and nothing. One of is the union of strategies, like the vertical or operator that we saw earlier. If you want uh, integers or floats, you can do one of. If you want arrays or lists, you can do one of arrays, lists. And nothing is a special strategy which is like the empty set. You can't generate anything from nothing because there's nothing there. And this means that if you pass one of nothing as well as some other stuff, the nothing just vanishes. So it's quite convenient if you're writing your own custom strategy functions, and there are some cases that where there's just nothing valid to generate. You can return nothing, and then that will sort of drop out at the union later, or it will raise a fairly helpful error if it makes it all the way to the user. Unfortunately, you can't in general subtract strategies or take the intersection, which would be natural if you think of these as sets of values, because those map or those filter functions that you applied can do arbitrary other things. They might be stateful, for example. If you're using the Django Extra, uh, it will generate you, for example, a user object for your web app, and make sure that the corresponding data is in the database. It's a little hard to work out how you would take the intersection of that and something else. So they're more like recipes than sets of values. The builds strategy is another special one. Uh, who here has ever written a custom class or a custom type in Python? Most of us. Well, if you want an example of one of those, you pass the class object or any function or callable object to build. And then you pass strategies corresponding to the positional and the keyword arguments that you want to pass to that. And Hypothesis will draw the values for the arguments, and then call your thing, and then give you the answer. Um, it also has some nice magical type inference. So if there's a required argument with type annotation that you don't pass a strategy for, Hypothesis will just work out how to call it for you. Recursive data. Who here has ever had a recursive data structure, like JSON? This defines every possible JSON object using hypothesis. It's a recursive data type. Base case is that it can be none, or a Boolean, or a number, 
a string. And then JSON objects can also be lists of any JSON objects or dictionaries with, where the keys are strings and the values are any JSON object. And so it takes two and a half lines to express that with hypothesis. Oh, strictly speaking, NAND is not allowed in JSON. So you want to exclude NAND in the I mentioned before that you can also infer strategies from types. The idea here is that it's designed as a time saver because our goal is not to make you spell out everything, it's to make you spell out just enough to make sure that it's unambiguous what you want. Um, so if the type inference isn't working, you can always write a strategy back. We try to avoid that thing where like, it's magic until it stops working and then you have to write everything by hand. In Hypothesis, you should always be able to write just the bits that you want on standard and have everything else in there. Um, and if you have custom types, you can also register a particular strategy if you have a class where, for example, the age is an integer, but it can never be negative, then you can register with hypothesis that whenever it's generating an instance of this class, it should respect that constraint. We've also got some others. Uh, who here has used regular expressions? They're pretty convenient. If you ever want random strings that match an arbitrary regular expression, hypothesis can give that to you, which is pretty useful. Who here has used NumPy? Let's do this again. If you want elements for some NumPy data type, Hypothesis can also infer those for you. And then if anyone here uses Django, which is maybe less likely at SciPy than PyCon, uh, we've got you covered there as well. Uh, a few design tips if you decide to write your own strategy inference functions, uh, which is a very useful pattern to sort of save time and make testing easier. I usually end up with the, the Hypothesis utils file in most of my test suites. It's always a good idea to err on the side of generating too much instead of too little. If you generate too much, then whoever's writing the test has to manually constrain it a little more. If you generate too little, then the tests pass when they shouldn't have. And in general, I tend to think that missed alarms are much worse than a little work to avoid false alarms in testing. Does that make sense? Has anyone here had a bug where you had a test for it, but the test didn't catch the bug? Yeah, few of us. And the last tip is that in Hypothesis, we're very careful to make sure that you can always customize anything that's inferred by passing in just the arguments that you care about and inferring the rest. I think that's a really important part. Um, I will skip through this Django example. But the short version is, say you have a project on something like GitHub. And we say, well, you've got some limited number of collaborators. So we want to charge you extra once your team gets large. We say like, well, if we take some list of users and some project with a random collaborator limit, then in taking each person in turn, we can either check that if we're already at the limit, then we can't add the person, or if we're not at the limit, we can add the person and then they're not, but they are on the team, right? This will pretty quickly find a problem where you didn't specify that the users had to be unique. And so this is kind of a bug in your test rather than a bug in your code, but those matter too. All right, last special strategies. Uh, for designing your own strategies, there's a couple of techniques. Uh, the simple one is composite, very closely related is flat map, but generally speaking, don't use flat map. It's a cute toy, but it's less readable than composite most of the time. And then the data strategy will get to it. So these are tools for when you need to generate some kind of input to your test that has an internal structure, something that you couldn't easily generate using map or filter. For example, if you need a list plus a valid index into the list. Trying to do this with filter by having a maximum size of the list and a maximum index, you would end up rejecting a lot of examples, especially for very short lists, you usually have an index that is too large. Um, so what Composite lets you do is it lets you draw examples from a strategy inside a function that defines a strategy. And so once you decorate it, whatever you return gets wrapped up in the strategy again as one of the examples that could be generated. However, you don't always need composite. Often you can save a bit of time by, for example, having this input validation outside the, what I call the inner composite. Uh, 
This could be useful because if you have very expensive validation of your inputs, which is often worthwhile when you're defining a custom strategy, you don't want to run that validation every single time you generate an example. You just want to run it once when you create a strategy. But in this particular case as well, uh, we don't actually need composite. You can just have a function which returns a strategy. Right? So I'm teaching a lot of fairly complex tools here. Don't reach for the most powerful ones. Reach for the least powerful ones that you can get away with. And functions which return things are a great trick. And then data is kind of like composite, but it runs inside your test function. So uh, the upside of this is that it's incredibly flexible and powerful. You can choose what kind of value you want hypothesis to give you based on what your test has done so far and how your code has behaved. Um, the downside is that this is incredibly powerful and flexible. And that means that the reports that hypothesis give you about what happens have to be a little more complicated because it's not just arguments to your function. We're also now talking about, well, inside your function, here is the sort of list of things that you asked for in which order. Um, so to summarize, like definitely use the data strategy if you need it, but check if you can get away with composite or just standard strategies first. All right, lastly, some tips about where to look. If you're like, I'm pretty sure this must exist, but where is it? If it's in the standard library or it's a built-in, it will be in the hypothesis.strategies module, which we usually import as ST for short. Um, there's a couple of ex exceptions, like if you're before Python 3.9, then you need the zone info backboard, but we just depend on that as part of the standard library in future Python. If you're using NumPy, the corresponding strategies live in hypothesis.extra.numpy so that they're there if you have NumPy installed, but if you don't have NumPy installed, Hypothesis still works for you. If you use pandas, that's in hypothesis.extra.pandas. You want to guess where the array API extension lives? Anyone? You got it. It's in hypothesis.extras.array API. <laughs> um, we also have a lot of third-party extensions which are listed in the documentation. Those will provide strategies, they'll provide inference for things, uh, various plugins. Uh, I haven't written all of those, so check them out for yourself. Yeah, anyone could just publish a hypothesis dash whatever package on the Python package index. Uh, and if it looks like it works, I will do the documentation. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I've sort of done security vetting or anything. Uh, it just means that this is a thing which notes that it is a hypothesis extension. Um, so it's listed as potentially an interest. All right. Um, we come now to our first set of exercises. So in the repo that I sent out, there are four sets of exercises. The first one is sort of an introductory set, which is more for future reference. Uh, so what we're doing here is the describing your data exercises. I'm going to say we'll come back together at 3 p.m. We'll take about 30 or 35 minutes for all the exercises, and then 10 or 15 minutes at the end of that as a break so that you can grab something to drink, stand up and stretch your legs and so on. Sound good? All right, let's get to it. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I think I saw like three or four of you stand up and take a break, so I admire your work ethic and feel sorry for your legs. Um, in this next section, we're going to be talking about what I've called um, common test patterns. So this is basically where I tell you about some particular properties of property-based tests that are applicable to a wide variety of code. Uh, but to do that, I'm actually going to use a tool that I developed after SciPy 2019, when I showed up and heard a lot of people say something like, oh, hypothesis. That sounds really cool, but I'm just not sure how to apply it to my code. And like every programmer, I know that social problems have technical solutions. So I sat down and I wrote some code that would solve this for me. So if you've installed Hypothesis, you will have this Hypothesis shell command. And if you ask Hypothesis to, oh no, that's bad. Um, Uh, 
this is what I get for not trying my live demo in advance. If you ask Hypothesis to write you some tests, um, you will. If you installed Hypothesis, see that's 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 my demo, right? You've got to install Hypothesis for this to work. But if you haven't, okay, okay. But if you've installed Hypothesis in a Python environment, which definitely exists, um, then you get a couple of what we call Ghostwriter patterns. Uh, the Ghostwriter is a thing that writes code for you, and then you can pretend to your colleagues that you wrote the code and it makes you look really productive. Uh, but the other thing that it does is it shows off a couple of very common patterns. Um, and so the first thing you can do is just let Hypothesis try to work out which of these patterns is applicable to your code. You can just point it at some module or some package, and it will write a bunch of tests. You can, yeah, it will produce the source code and write it to send it out, and you can pipe that into a test file, and then just like, if you've got type annotations, you're done, and you can go home early. Uh, and if you don't, you can use that as a template, which is customized to your code. Uh, I think it's pretty cool, but then again, I would. Um, but you've also got these four common properties that the Ghostwriter understands. So the first is equivalence. I mentioned this earlier, but it's a pattern where your code should do the same thing as some other code. Maybe you're re-implementing a function which already exists in NumPy or SciPy, and you can check that it does the same thing. There's also the round trip one. Uh, so the example here is JSON, that if you dump some object to JSON and then you load it back, you should get an equal object. There's also the item potence property, which is if you call a function on its own output, you should get the same output again. So for example, sorted should be item potent. Um, there's also uh, the binary op one, which I just put in to show off really, like how often do you implement binary operators in Python? Um, but if you do, then you can use hypothesis to check that your binary operator is associative and commutative and has the expected identity element. So uh, let's write a test for the sort function. Um, well, okay, so we don't actually have a sort function in the hypothesis tells us that. Um, so how about the sort end function? And here we have a quick test. This is pretty similar to what I showed you earlier in the talk, uh, but a little different. When I was writing tests for sorted at the start of this tutorial, I neglected entirely to mention the key argument and the reverse flag. And so this test doesn't check that those two properties that we had earlier, that it's pairwise ordered and we have the same elements, but it does check that we can pass the reverse flag. And so the ghostwriter has already kind of proven itself useful there. We can also check, you know, as a known pattern, that sorted is item potent. And so the ghostwriter will then sort the input argument, sort the output of that, and then assert that those two results are equal. And again, I would use this as a starting point, right? But the idea is to kind of help you jump in and apply it to your own code faster. Um, if we wanted to test that two functions are equivalent, like the two I'm doing here are the eval built-in and the ast.literal eval function. And these should be the same on anything that literal eval works on. What you're seeing here is actually some of the limitations of the ghostwriter. Because these functions have different names of their arguments, the ghostwriter can't quite tell how they're meant to match up automatically. So what you've got here is a template that you can work off, where you would need to edit this to make node and, or string and source actually the same argument to both. As is, this test function just calls both of them and, well, hopes for the best. It's probably not going to work. If you want to test a binary operator, like addition. Uh, who here trusts the addition operator in Python? Some of you? Okay, the rest of you, you can test it. <laughs> so what we've got here is a somewhat longer one. We've actually got multiple tests written here. We, we are not quite sure what the operands to addition are. Maybe we should say they're integers or, or floats. You could also pass strings, right? Python can do string plus string. Uh, but you've got to have the same thing. So that's a global constant here. And then we test that it's associative. And we test that it's commutative. And we have a sort of placeholder test for the identity element. In this case, it would be that adding zero to anything we can add, well, should give you the same thing. For, tech, for strings, though, the identity element would be the empty string. If you add the empty string, you get whatever string you started with. 
Okay, so far so good. Let's write a test for gzip compression. What property might we have here? In this case, the ghostwriter will look in the module and notice there's also a decompress function in that same module. And so it will guess that if you compress some input and then you decompress that output, you should get your input back. So it's automatically detected that there's an equivalence going on. I have a list of regular expressions and format patterns. Uh, this is the secret of a lot of hypothesis. It looks like it's magic, but just like real stage magic, it merely consists of somebody who has practiced a lot putting in an unreasonable amount of work to make it look effortless. Um, I, I think the answer there is you should edit the out output from the ghost writer. Right? It's a starting point. Not, it's not designed to be the only test you ever have. Uh, and so there are a number of places as well where the ghostwriter output is deliberately incomplete, where it actually requires some work from you to fill out. For example, here, data is nothing. And so that nothing strategy, it will actually fail to generate. If you try to run this test, you'll get an error that says, I can't generate anything for the nothing strategy. You need to fill that out. And you've also got a comment to that bit, ghostwriter source code. Uh, so that bit's up to you. If we write a test for json.doms, uh, well, we've got the loads function as well, uh, but a lot of what you learn is that json takes a lot of arguments. There's a lot of different ways to customize json loading and saving in Python. Uh, so I just produced a cut down version of this where I also specified that what the object should be, right? And you might remember from when I was talking about recursive data, this is how we can describe all possible JSON values, that it's one of those scalar base cases, or it's any list of JSON values, or any dictionary with string keys and JSON values. Following so far? Cool. It's so nice to be able to see my audience and not be teaching online again. <laughs> uh, and then we have this simple test. We dump it to a string, we load it from a string, and then we check that we got a thing equal to what we started. So let's just run PyTest on this file. What do we think is going to happen? Will it pass? Yes? No? Why not? Everyone thinks it will pass? Okay, why won't it pass? Okay, you're a very suspicious crowd and, <laughs> and justifiably so. It does in fact fail. <laughs> uh, so we've got two things here. Uh, the first is that it fails because NAND is not equal to NAND. Okay, fair enough. If the input is not equal to itself, then the output will not be equal to the input. The other reason it fails is that if allow NAND is false and the object is infinity, then the JSON library will actually say that these non-finite values are invalid in JSON. So the JSON spec, strictly speaking, only allows finite numbers. Python, by default, will allow you to save infinity, negative infinity, and there. But there's an argument, which for historical reasons is called allow man, but it also disallows infinity. So let's see what we can do about this. Uh, we can add an assume, which is like a filter, that the object is equal to itself. And we'll say that we always allow non-finite numbers. Right? Fairly small diff. Do we think this fixed test is going to pass? Maybe. Gosh, I have made you all paranoid. <laughs> Not sure about the assertions. It still fails. Well, it should, but, but <laughs> I wouldn't want to give away the game too soon. Um, and so what we see here is that uh, a list containing NAND compares equal to itself. It turns out that Python has a performance optimization because lists often have nested subcollections where if 
an element of a list is equal by identity to another element of a list, then it will just return true. So if you have a list and compare it to itself, it always compares equal, even if it's got NANs in it. If you put the same NAN object in two lists, those lists will still compare equal if they're at the same index. Until you round trip it through JSON and you have a different NAN object, and then it fails. Uh, so the correct fix is in fact just to say that hypothesis should not generate NANs. Do you think this one's gonna pass? Yes, yes, we're confident now. Maybe you're not so suspicious after all. No, so it preserves NANs, so it just represents them as NAN in the JSON output. Uh, but this is an extension to the JSON format, technically. So you can pass allow NAN equals false, and then that will become an error if you try to encode it or decode it. Right. And this one does indeed pass. Ooh. So hopefully you will enjoy using Ghostwriter on your own code as well. the name of the module or the name of the file. Yep, if you do hypothesis write numpy, you get like a thousand lines of test output. Yeah. Um, the sprints are coming up, let's leave it at that. <laughs> Um, do you have hypothesis installed in the environment? Uh, no, if the command is not found, it'll be a, an install issue of some kind. I will come over and after I've done this talk and talk to you about that. Uh, or, Uh, so the question was, do we use the same random number to generate the examples each time? Uh, we'll cover that in the section after this. By default, it varies, but we have various anti flakiness techniques. All right, let's jump into design patterns for tests, or what I've called tactics to distinguish them from strategies. So a couple of common ones. Um, there's the fuzzing or the does not crash property, which is just if you call your code with arbitrary inputs that it should handle, Whatever it does, it should not raise an exception. Um, there's round trip and equivalent ones, which we've just seen ghost written. There's metamorphic properties, which is an amazing mouthful for a very useful thing. And then there are some situationally useful properties. So just call your code on random inputs. It's embarrassingly effective. So that's about all I'll say. Like, just do it. If you're not sure what property to test, write a test with no assertions in it. Just call your code and see what exceptions come. Round trips. Uh, the ghostwriter will find many of these for you. Uh, but the basic patterns, anytime you save data and load it, anytime you encode and decode to some format, anytime you send and receive data between processes or over a network, anytime you're converting between different data points, this is a thing where often different data formats like can't represent exactly the same thing, but it's a really useful exercise to work out what, what is the largest subset that both formats support and check that it round trips that subset losslessly. Um, or you can even use round trips for things which aren't strictly a serialization or a load save pattern. For example, if you multiply and then you divide, um, or you convert each way, that kind of thing. So anytime you have a function which should undo the result of some other function, you factorize and then multiply, for example. Um, round trips are, I think, the single most useful and single most powerful property for you to test. Every code base has at least a couple, right? If your code base never reads or write output, you can replace most of it with pass, and then it will run much faster as well. Um, but round trips tend to be completely critical to your code, right? If you can't load or save your data, uh, what are you even doing? Uh, they also tend to have relatively complicated inputs and outputs because everything that goes into your code has to be loaded or properly saved at some point. But they're also places where errors are relatively common because your loading and saving logic or your send it over the network logic will typically cross many layers of the stack. 
right? It's not purely written in Python. It's usually gluing together a couple of drivers or a program or dealing with multiple layers. Uh, and finally, round trip bugs are often prone to silent failure, where you go to write some complicated data out and something gets written to disk, but a little loss on it. And detecting those needs a test. If it's not going to crash, but just produce wrong output, you've got to actually write a test for it. So if you take nothing else away from this, property test your round trips. Equivalent functions, uh, I think are great. Whenever they come up, they are a little situational. You don't always have an equivalent on hand. But it's often pretty easy to go like, well, I have this multi-threaded thing. Let me run it with one thread and with eight threads and check that I always get the same result. Uh, the old version or the new version, the Fortran version versus the Python version. Yep. How do you test the old and the new version? Uh, it can be a little tricky to set up. I'm just repeating the question for the recording. Um, it can be a little tricky to set up, but often I can just make a copy of the repository, check it out under a different name, and then import both into the same test portal. Uh, you do have to be a little careful to avoid name collisions there, but it, it is doable. Um, and for equivalent functions, important to note they don't have to be perfectly equivalent. Right? Often we end up writing functions which overlap to some of their behavior, or you implement a faster version for a subset of a function in NumPy, for example. Uh, on those, you can test that it's equivalent just for those inputs where it should be the same. Uh, or as a more general pattern, that it's the same unless you get a particular exception. Yep. Yeah, so you, you can use this for any case you're like, well, the results should be within a certain epsilon. Uh, that absolutely works here. You almost always have to do that with floating point outputs as well. Uh, if you're using not literally the exact same code or sometimes even the, uh, you know, the same plus or minus, you know, one part in a thousand or whatever it is. Um, that said, machine learning out tools can be a little tricky to test in this style because machine learning tends to optimize for getting things right most of the time, whereas hypothesis will find the very weird, very rare inputs where it gets it much wronger than usual. Uh, maybe that's what you want, but it's not always. Absolutely, right? If you have some domain or some set of inputs where you're like, no, it absolutely must get all of these right to within epsilon, it's great for that. All right, uh, another general property, and this one is embarrassingly simple, just check that the output is reasonable. If you're calculating a probability, it should probably be between zero and one. If you're calculating something to do with energy, that should probably be conserved. Um, if you expect a number, check that you got a number. Check that your array has the expected number of dimensions, that it's the right size and shape, it's got the right data type. If you're getting strings, check that they're not empty, check that they don't have null characters in them. Um, the other thing is that I try to put these assertions in my code rather than in my tests. And that's so that if it comes up in testing or when I've deployed or shipped my code or I'm using it for real, I want to find out about those errors by having it crash as soon as possible because these are bugs. Um, and it's much easier if that crash comes as close as possible to the time when something invalid or something unexpected Great question. Do I track that or do I just let it crash and have the user report it? I think this really depends on your domain, right? If you're writing the code as part of like a six person team at a university, just letting it crash and having someone walk over to your desk sounds like a great answer. If you're running YouTube or something, you probably have very sophisticated logging. The cases in between, it, it really comes down to what are you doing? What are the consequences if it crashes for your users? Um, how bad would that be? So on. Um, there's a lot of questions where the answer is just like, it depends, but it does depend. All right, um, and you saw this briefly in the binary operators. There are a couple of like, what we think of as like classic algebraic properties. Um, because property-based testing was invented in Haskell, that's why it's named property-based testing. Um, that said, they're actually pretty rare in Python, so I don't tend to think about these ones much compared to just testing round trips and then my code doesn't crash. Yeah, this one here. 
like here, uh, would I use a separate library to validate that I got the expected data? Uh, I think that depends on my problem. So if I'm dealing with data frames, there are a lot of helpful libraries to like give you schemas for various kinds of data. Um, I'm also just fond of the assert statement. Uh, but yeah, like, it kind of depends on what your data is and what exactly you're checking. Uh, probably whatever domain you're working in, you have your preferred tools for checking that your data makes sense. I would just use those. Like, a big part of the hypothesis philosophy is that like hypothesis users are also Python users and can be trusted to write code. So we try to give you tools to write code instead of tools that let you get out of writing code. Uh, even the ghostwriter, right? It, it gives you a starting point for you to write tests rather than doing it all for you. Okay, and I mentioned towards the start that a more complex form is what we call model-based or stateful testing. So what I've been talking about through this whole tutorial is about getting hypotheses to generate inputs to your test functions. Um, from a certain point of view, though, generating uh, or choosing which action to take out of a set of possible actions uh, is also just a different kind of data that could be generated by hypothesis. So if you have something where there's like a sequence of API calls, like a tree or a graph of possible actions, you can use hypothesis to explore that in this kind of state machine style. Um, this is particularly useful for things which have stateful APIs, uh, but it would be a whole other workshop and the SciPy tutorial community did not accept it this year. Uh, so I'm just telling you that this more powerful style exists. You will not need it very often. I've written these about four times in total. But if you do need it, you can go looking for it. Metamorphic relations. Metamorphic relations are relationships between two inputs and their corresponding outputs. So a standard property in a property-based test is a relationship between the input and the output. But especially in science, often we don't know the relationship between the input and the output because that's why we're writing our code to find out. But we might know something about the relationship between input-output pairs. For example, that uh, if we double the amount of energy in the input, then the amount of energy in the output should be correspondingly doubled. Or we'll have some other kind of invariance like that. Um, so a couple of classic cases. One was from compiler testing. You generate a little random program, you generate an input and run it, and then you randomize every part of that program that wasn't executed by that particular input. Compile the new program, run it on the same input, and if you get a different result, it's compilable. Turns out to be pretty common. Um, metamorphic relations are basically how I think about testing invariances. So if you have something like conservation of mass or energy, right? Well generate one input, you can check that the energy is the same in the input the output, or you can check that if you modify one, you get the corresponding modification in the output. We use this to test Astrophy, actually. We would take, what, we would generate a random timestamp and cycle it through a few different formats, and then we would add a small epsilon to it and cycle it through the same. And the two outputs should be about as close together as the two inputs. Uh, when they weren't, we knew that we found a precision problem. Make sense? Metamorphic properties are a little tricky because they depend so closely on the specific domain that you're working in. So I can't really give you many great examples specific to your domain. Like, happy to talk about that in the hallway afterwards. But the bottom line here is that when you're writing property-based tests, the first thing to do is write some assertions in your code. The second thing to do is just call your code and see if it crashes. And the third thing is to write property-based tests for any round trips that you can think of. At that point, I really do think you've got at least 80% of the value you're going to get out of property-based testing. And more to the point, once you've done this, I think you'll know what it's like to apply a hypothesis to your code base, and you'll have a much better sense about what other things it might be worth using it for. But here's where to start. Okay, uh, alternatively though, since we've still got some time left, we can do some exercises on common test tactics. Um, so this is going to be the next notebook, the one number two or O2, which is on common test tactics. Let's give this till 20 past four. Okay, I think it's 20 to five. Let's jump into the last tutorial chunk of the day. Um, I'm calling this one, putting it into practice. <laughs>
And the idea is it's the kind of practical tips that become useful when you actually use hypothesis for real, you know, at work or in open source projects, that don't show up if you're just using it in a Jupyter notebook in a tutorial. Uh, I'm aware that a lot of the exercises I've given you are like a little small, a little artificial. And the goal of this section is to teach you the other things that are useful to know when you go to use it on 10,000 or 100,000 line projects. Things where you have CI running, for example. Um, so I'm also going to encourage questions through this whole section. Just shout them out. I'll repeat them from microphones. They get recorded. Uh, and then I might tell you, I'll answer that in four slides. Uh, so let's jump into it. So we've gone through the kind of principles of property-based testing, described what it is, looked at generating data, and then the kinds of properties that you might want to test for your code. So this last section is like miscellaneous, stuff that's worth knowing that doesn't fit well. Um, I'm calling that design patterns for the property-based test suites. We've talked about design patterns for individual tests. So how do you fit this into a broader testing strategy? I'm going to talk about settings and how you configure things, whether and how to share the example database and what that actually is, uh, and then look a little bit about coverage guided fuzzing and the hypothesis and testing ecosystem more broadly. Okay, so the first thing I want to tell you is that you should not just write property-based tests. I like them a lot. Hopefully you guys also understand a little of why I like them. But I would never recommend that you only write property-based tests. Often, I will use hypothesis for the first test that I write, just because it's a good way to get a quick indication of whether the thing works at all. But as a test suite, I've worked on projects where we have one test that uses hypothesis. It just sort of throws in any possible value and sees whether things crash, to a few projects where almost all of our tests were property-based. And this was mostly for tools that were converting between different formats which is somewhere where property-based testing is really powerful. But most of the time, it's going to be like some fraction, typically maybe between 10 and 50% of my tests use hypothesis, and the remainder are classic unit tests, snapshot tests, various others. Um, the second thing about a, a property-based test suite is that writing custom strategies for your project can be a really powerful pattern. So we talked about that a little earlier, where you can use the composite decorator or just write a function which returns strategies. Often, for example, if you're working with data frames, you'll have data frames that represent a couple of different types of data. And the data frame strategy in hypothesis.extra.pandas is kind of complicated because you can specify things about what columns, what rows, what contents, all this sort of thing. So being able to wrap that up into a sort of more abstract function, which describes it in terms which are relevant to your particular project, can offer me a great way to do that. And that means that when you need to update the strategy, you can update it in one place and then all of your tests will use that new definition. And this kind of additive rather than multiplicative scaling really helps once you have a couple of people working on it or a project that lasts more than a few days. Yep. Um, do I usually put it in a config file or where? Um, yeah, often I'll have like a test utils file somewhere. Sometimes like comp test.py, maybe my package will have a, you know, dot underscore test util submodule. Like where exactly it doesn't matter that much, but somewhere where they're convenient to get to. Uh, and a couple of patterns for this. Uh, the simplest one is just like at the top of your test file, assign strategies to global variables. This works. Strategies are pretty much stateless. Um, so you can just then use those in the given decorator for each test. Um, another one is to write functions which return strategies. That's maybe more scalable if you want to customize them a little bit. Uh, and then finally, register type strategy for custom types. Makes it very easy to pick those up all over the place. And I would usually register those in something like a comp test.py, so that whenever I load up my tests, it does the registration before I start executing it. All right, uh, hands up, who uses a debugger? Who uses print debugging? Yeah, pretty much all of us. Print debugging is actually great. Uh, but you might have noticed with Hypothesis, when you call print inside your test function, it gets executed many times. So Hypothesis also ships with this note function, which is print, but only on the final example. And that means you will go less crazy with like 100 times however many print statements you have lines of output. 
The other one that's useful if you do want to summarize over all of the times that it's executed is the event function. And what this will do is it will pass whatever you do it to a string, and then it will show you what proportion of inputs had each distinct value. So for example, you could check that you have positive and negative things about an even amount of the time, or see you know, which operation you do and what proportion. This is mostly useful just to check that things aren't much rarer than you expect, right? That you get about an even mixture rather than, you know, if you used a filter, for example, that can skew the distribution quite lopsidedly. Uh, the thing to note is that event is not printed by default. Event is just shown as part of the statistics. So if you pass dash dash hypothesis shows statistics on the command line, uh, it will print something like this for your test function. You say, well, when you were generating examples, uh, here were the run times and here was the sort of fraction of time spent generating data compared to writing, running your test code. Uh, that tends to be a higher fraction when you're generating things like NumPy arrays or data frames because NumPy operates very quickly, but filling out an array of numbers sort of one by one chosen by a hypothesis takes a little longer. Uh, and we've got the custom events where you can see that you know, generating lists of length two here was a little bit more complicated than the single element lists. And then while shrinking, this tended to run much more quickly because we were dealing with smaller examples. Make sense to people? Cool. Settings. Um, so there are a couple of things. Uh, you can determine your settings using profiles, which can be set from conftest.py. And you can choose a profile using pytest flags, or you can write your own code to activate whichever setting based on the environment variable or literally anything else, right? It's just Python code, you will know how to write Python code. You can also use settings as a decorator on a single test. If there's just one test that you want to run for, say, 10,000 examples instead of 100, you just write at settings, max examples equals 10,000. Um, and you can also set some of these from the PyTest command line. This is another quick and easy option. The settings that you are most likely to care about, and you can read about all of these in the documentation, uh, there's a deadline which is how long is each individual test case allowed to take before Hypothesis warns you that this is taking suspiciously long. By default, that's 200 milliseconds, so one fifth of a second. Uh, for some things, particularly if you're using big NumPy arrays, this might be too short, in which case you can just set a longer deadline or even disable it. Uh, the other one is max examples. Hypothesis by default will try 100 examples, and then if none of those have failed, it will give up and move on. If you want that to be faster, you can turn it down and be correspondingly a little less likely to find bugs. Or if you really, really want to find bugs, you can turn it up and take correspondingly longer. Um, performance analysis is not always easy, but if you run twice as many examples, it will take about twice as long. This is an easy case. Uh, and then I showed you the statistics. Well, they'll tell you both the average and sort of range of variation for the runtime. I was also asked earlier, uh, do we use the same random seed each time? The answer by default is no, but there is a setting for this. Uh, if you want to run exactly the same set of examples every time you run your tests, you can use the de-randomized setting. Uh, or if you need to set the random seed for reproducibility, you can set dash dash hypothesis seed equals whatever number. Uh, that can also be useful in reproducing things that failed in CI uh, on a remote machine where the database won't replay things for you automatically. I do tend to recommend running in non-deterministic mode because it makes it more likely that you'll find a bug. But this is a bit of a trade-off, right? Where the more likely it is that you find a bug, if it's a rare bug, sometimes this can come up and make the test fail for an unrelated change. And it's sort of a question about your team's workflow, whether you prefer that to happen or whether you want that to happen in a separate build so that your pull request tests are always consistent. Another issue that can lead to flaky tests is if you use a random number generator. Who here ever uses a random number generator? Lots of us. Uh, the problem with random number generators is, is that they generate random numbers. And if some random numbers make your test fail and others don't, uh, that will be sad. Um, so the, the first mitigation is if you can pass a random object, like random.random, uh, hypothesis can generate random number generators for you. And under the hood, it will then generate you random numbers, which are secretly evil numbers 
and it will then give you like the shortest, simplest sequence of random numbers that make the test fail. Um, but if that doesn't work, Hypothesis actually does seed and then restore the previous state of Python standard library random num number generator and also NumPy's random number generator. We'd be using that. So if you expect those to vary, then you need to use the random module strategy, which will make sure that they actually get different seeds every time instead of the same seed for every single example. Uh, hypothesis will generate sort of arbitrary numbers for you, and then if it ever fails, it will then do its usual replay and shrinking technique. Um, if you have another global random number generator, well, you can register it. Um, if that's in a library, tell me and I will try to handle it by default for you. Okay. You might have noticed when you ran a test, it took a little while to fail the first time and failed very quickly when you rerun it. That's down to the hypothesis example database. Every time a test fails, we save the underlying state. So we generated something with our random number generator. Then we turned that using a strategy into the data that your test wanted, and then we called your test function on it. We save that intermediate layer in what we call the database. And for every failure, we start the test when you run it next time by replaying everything we've ever seen fail before. And so your test shouldn't be flaky, even though we randomly discover the failures. So to reproduce failures, step one is like, well, just run the test again. If you're on the same machine, it will just replay whatever that example was. If you want to share this, you can use the at example decorator. This was in some of the exercises. Did everyone get there? Some people? I see a few nodding heads, a few shakes. So at example uh, is just like at given, but instead of passing strategies, you pass the exact values that you want to test. And then, sorry, it will try running those exact values every single time before it moves on to generating new random ones for you. So this is great for regression testing. Or if you're concerned that you want to make sure you get great code coverage every time and not risk hypothesis is good at this, but make sure that you always hit every branch instead of relying on happening to randomly generate them, you can make sure that the at example inputs get you good coverage for everything you know about and then generate more random examples using given. Yep. Uh, so if you change the test, that modifies the database key. So it would need to regenerate whatever failure was in there. In practice, this doesn't tend to be an issue. Uh, any order of the decorators will work. Um, we thought about requiring a special order, and then we thought this would be a pain in the neck. Everyone would have to remember, let's just make it work no matter what you do. Absolutely. So if you have an existing parameterized test, this is a great candidate. You can convert each of the current examples to an at example decorator and then add an at given decorator to generate more of them. Um, if you use like two parameterized calls to get a cross product of things, um, you might want to write your own little like meta decorator that does that in terms of this. All right. So these are the simple ways to reproduce any failing examples you have. Um, if things fail in CI, uh, we have a print blob setting, which will print a uh, base64 encoded blob, uh, which will guarantee that it reproduces. Uh, if Hypothesis can tell that it's running in CI, it will enable this by default, because it is a horrible experience to have things fail in CI and not be able to reproduce it locally. Uh, ask me about the NumPy there issue someday. Um, so reproduce failure is a temporary decorator. Um, you can put it on, like, when it fails in CI, it will print out the decorator, you can copy paste it into your code and run it to make it fail. If it doesn't fail, then it will raise an error. Say something's wrong here, you told me to reproduce failure and it didn't reproduce, what's going on? If it does fail, it will also add that example to your local database. So when you take it away, it will keep failing for the same reason. Make sense? Okay. 
the next step is, well, maybe you just want to share the database. Uh, the database is just like a directory of files. Uh, they're addressed for like a hash of the test function in a fairly complicated way. And then the contents are just byte strings. So you can just share this in the same way you would share any other blob of files. Um, that said, you're probably better off using something like Redis if you're planning to share this with a team rather than trying to check it into Git and having this binary blob of data that changes at the time. Um, so I've actually had really good luck uh, doing something like this. We say, well, we'll have a server which holds the database for the whole team and for CI. So if CI fails, you reproduce this locally by running the tests, and it just pulls them out of CI. Um, this particular example is actually saying that in development mode, we'll use a local database and then a read-only wrapper around the shared database. So that CI can add failures to there, but local runs don't delete anything that's already in there. With me so far? Another neat trick, which I think is probably more relevant for scientific and numerical code than most, is what we call target or guided testing. So Hypothesis is mostly a sort of heuristically random black box explorer. Uh, target gives it an, a particular label that it can try to optimize. So you feed it a number and optionally a label, and it will try to do a hill climbing search to maximize that. This is particularly useful, for example, if you're asserting that two functions produce the same output to within some epsilon. You can say, try to maximize the difference between them. And that will often do much, much better than an unguided search. Uh, in turn, this means that like, your chance of improving a bug, of finding a bug like, with each test input actually improves over time rather than staying close to the um, A couple of uses that I found great, well, target that the the, your epsilon in this difference between things is below an error threshold, or target the number of elements in some collection or the number of unprocessed jobs in a queue, target the mean or the maximum runtime of something, target the compression ratio, or as an, a way to avoid filtering, right? If you want to write a test that applies to both valid and invalid data, you can just target a sort of binary whether or not it's valid so that it tries to spend relatively more time generating valid than invalid data without rejecting the invalid data entirely. <laughs> the generalized form of this is if you don't know what to target, conceptually, you could just target each branch of code or each line in your program. So, well, each time you execute an input that covers some bit of the code that we haven't seen covered before, try more variations on that. And this is particularly good if you have some sort of sequence of branches which are only rarely taken you'll be sort of multiplying the probabilities together to find out how likely it is to make it past all of them by chance. But if you have coverage guided testing, then it will actually try variations on each furthest through step that it's found. And so it's additive instead of multi multiplicatively unlikely. Um, there are short examples here. I'll honestly say like consult the documentation if you want to do it fuzzing. Um, I also have a tool called HypoFuzz. Uh, which is designed specifically for hypothesis. Uh, and it gives you nice log plots that you can sort of draw straight lines on if you use a very, very fat marker. Uh, as to hypothesis update cadence, uh, the way we manage this is that every single pull request results in a new release. So if you report a bug, it will get fixed reasonably quickly, and then it will be released as soon as the bug fix is merged. Maybe like, 15 minutes later, see. Uh, that helps avoid the problem where you fix a bug and then it sits on master for two months while you wait for it to be released. And then you need to work around in your own code, which is not fun. Uh, the other thing this means is that at the sprints, we might have five or six new releases of hypothesis. And so if you're using it at work, you should probably be pinning your dependencies. Uh, update on whatever schedule works for you. <coughs> so, that's my kind of miscellaneous tips for using the hypothesis. Happy to take any further questions now. Nope. All right. Well, thanks for coming. We'll have a last set of exercises to close out our time together or circulate around. But to summarize, please test your code with hypothesis. Don't have bugs anymore, just in C. Thanks very much. <laughs>